both uh, historical but also some present cases and I will kind of end with zooming into the Dalsland context to, to see how, how does this uh, or what exists, uh, what kind of frugal examples exist uh, in the Dalsland region or context. Uh, I will also like post myself the question why is frugal so in interesting or important and uh, maybe draw out some possible ways forward and then we end uh, with questions and comments and hopefully a, a conversation that can be fruitful. So that was the plan and first uh, before I start, I would like to say a few words about myself. Uh, I am an educated industrial designer from University of Gothenburg, and that was in the mid 90s. Um, and after I have been working as a design consultant for many years, running my own business, so I'm used to be uh, the one that has to take care of all the, the whole business. Uh, and I have also been trained, I think, in uh, moving into different kinds of contexts. So I, I have really appreciated the consultancy work. And at the same time, I have been teaching uh, because I think it has always been a very fruitful uh, combination, teaching and uh, practice in design. And uh, in 2012, I had the opportunity to become a PhD student in design uh, connected to something called Mr. Urban Future. And they had a node in Kenya. It was a global or international research platform. And my work took it the starting point in Kenya. And that gave me a lot of new ideas and perspectives on the design work and what frugal actually can be and what we can do with it uh, and how we can maybe become more frugal as designers and artists and crafts people and uh, today I am a researcher and lecturer in design at Tordekovarland but I also work at Chalmers uh, and I work uh, also with as a strategic design consultant again so I I work for the National Handicraft Council so today I actually kind of represent the National Handicraft Council Namden for Hemslöjtsfrågor because my work in Kenya has kind of also made me more and more interested in the crafts uh, field. So I see myself as a designer who works with crafts people and through craft because I think craft and art is a very good like tools or methods for how to work together in a sustainable way. And uh, some examples from my research is uh, in from Linnarhult, where I do a project called Transforming the City for Play. And as you can see on the right, you who know Carl Halberg see that uh, he is also connected to this project, and it's based in Linnarhult. And I am um, when I'm teaching, I love to teach outside. So one of the slides uh, are from Linnarhult, where we have prototyped uh, ideas with students and uh, I at Chalmers we the work that I do there is still connected to Kenya so we kind of practice uh, frugal design in the in the in the work we do and I also have also had the opportunity to work with students from Steneby so I was part of a or I was uh, engaged in a project called Undesirables that was uh, uh, in 2014, where the students actually work with some of the challenges or, and potential, some resources that I was working with in Kenya. So it was a very nice collaboration. So I tried to bring in these experiences from Kenya in my work. And uh, as a practitioner, I am mostly, yeah, as a consultant, I. I help people to, I hold lectures, I do workshops, but I also have one uh, personal interest and that is working with like sustainable product development and trying to continue the work the, that I did in Kenya. So uh, work with local production, but work in kind of global or local networks. 
So that was a little bit about me. Um, yeah, so what is frugal? We come to the definition part. And uh, this is picked from Mariam Webster, which I usually have as a reference when I do research. And they say uh, there are many definitions, but one is careful about spending money or using things when you do not need to using money or supplies in a very careful way and when we then go to economy you can read thrifty and efficient use of material resources frugality in expenditures so this is where we see that the frugal and economy is is closely connected and it is about uh, using and making use of resources and assets in a as i see it both creative but also careful way so there is something about the care for what you have that i want to stress when i talk about the the frugal or frugal economy uh, and then if we further unpack what frugal can be. Uh, they, I found some really interesting work by somebody or s someone called uh, Lastovica. It was a team, Lastovica et al. It was a team of researchers that they are working with. They are from the marketing side, so they come more from the economic side, but they have been working on consumer research. And they have investigated the frugal or the frugality as a kind of lifestyle trait. And they couldn't find uh, research uh, on this in the marketing field. So they went to different fields. They went to the economic field. They, went to the, they looked at it from religious perspective, self-help literature, and also study like the early American society when that was grounded and they could see like the frugal could be found in all these different areas. And from this, they tried to see like a measurement structure for understanding who is the frugal consumer, if you say so. And if I just read here, frugality is a lifestyle trait reflecting disciplined acquisition and resourcefulness in product and service use. Frugality is sacrifice in denying a series of short-term purchasing whims and industriousness by resourcefully using what is already owned or available for use. All of this is in service of achieving longer-term goals. And this is again something interesting from my perspective because the frugal way of working or being a consumer or practicing is about some kind of uh, you can see it as a sacrifice or you do this because you think that something else will happen if i do this i do this also for somebody else it's not only for myself i contribute somehow to more maybe sustainable society and that you are having these long-term goals, which I uh, believe is very important now that we, we look upon the way we work and the way we buy things, that we, are, we, are in, uh, we have to be careful uh, what we are uh, buying. So uh, in uh, frugal innovation, which is a pathway or field in innovation, uh, they talk about the frugal as also a way to deal with innovation and one of the researchers that I, I, I i'm really fond of reading when i read about frugal innovation is they uh, they yeah you say biatti and vantresca they define uh, in a loose way frugal innovation as to do more with less for money um, and the frugal innovation or frugal way of thinking about innovation uh, was established in the about 2010 it's the first time you that was expressed uh, in, in literature and and this concerned innovation for 
the so-called developing uh, countries or what you also say global south where people are maybe lacking opportunities to to buy they have limited resources but there are also an innovation potential to find out what is needed what kind of resources are there that we can actually make use of so this became something that interests me during my uh, my uh, research work that kind of also is the entry point for this uh, for this lecture and i don't know if you see me now can you see me yes uh, this is my thesis so this yellow book and it's called designing together a frugal design approach so uh, and the frugal became like the entry point and as you can see the yellow color in this presentation is also uh, connected to my book and the the place where i worked in kenya it was in kisumo in uh, uh, in kenya and uh, it is a city that is uh, well population wise like Gothenburg, I think it has increased much more now, but when we started the research. And, uh, but of course, the situation was very, very different. Um, one of the things that caught my attention from the very start was an invasive plant called the water hyacinth that you see on the, to the right on the top picture. So it was a plant that was growing in the lake and it was, uh, floating because and it was seasonal so so sometimes during the year it was blocking um, the harbors and the beaches so people couldn't get out with their boats and it was a huge economic social and environmental problem but i also uh, find out that some people were making use of this and these were the what i would say like the slayed people in Kisumu uh, in Kenya, they are called Yuakali, which means under the hot sun, because they have these temporary structures. They are street innovators. And I started to work with these street innovators, the Yuakalis, and uh, which became like a huge inspiration and also affected my way of, of thinking about frugal, the frugal. And uh, some people write about the frugal context and try to figure out what is a frugal context. And of course, it is different depending on where you are. But having in mind that this is written by people who work in the global south, uh, there are three kind of criteria. So one is resource scarcity constraints. There can be lack of access to certain uh, knowledge, uh, technologies, materials and equipment that, for example, makes it possible to scale up or to have a very precise or uh, certain shapes are almost impossible to do. There are also market affordability constraints. So people are living under the poverty line, uh, which is about um, $1.9. So they cannot buy what they want. They have to be frugal and think about what is the most, uh, the things that they value the most. Uh, and a large part of the population live under the po poverty line. And, and a very tricky thing that is not so visible, but it came very clear that this is a huge challenge for people who are living and trying to find out how to work uh, in the frugal context is the in institutional voids and complexities. So the institutions are maybe often actually corrupt and they are not quite weak. And uh, maybe the institutions that mean something are the informal networks where people are depending on each other, they help each other. So what we would call maybe the uh, some kind of social innovation or uh, clusters where people were kind of self-help self, uh, clusters, often connected to tribes of family members, but also neighbors, for example. Um, and often in Kenya, they call these networks for uh, communities, communities of practice. Can You can say that you are Kali, uh, the workers are a kind of community of practice. So when I started to think about like 
okay, but what is then the frugal design approach? How can I deal with these challenges? So my, my stand oh, entry point was, let's make use of what already exists. Uh, engage the local actors and their networks. So let's find out how can we work together in global partnerships. If there are no formal institutions, can I as a researcher use the institution I come from? Uh, can we work in partnership? Can we work in projects where we can develop things together? And one of the things that we tried to figure out uh, to work with was uh, this water hyacinths. Uh, baskets that was already made. Uh, we kind of redesigned them with support from a company called Afrat. Uh, the Aconia, a development organization, was part. There were several organizations and uh, Business Sweden were part of this project where we tried to see, like, can we connect people who are skilled in making use of this higher sense and create some kind of product development uh, um, uh, yeah, the development process, uh, but it was shown that this was super difficult actually. And as many of you maybe feel that are part of this project culture that exists today, you also know that projects end. And what happens with the people and the things that has been developed during the project time when it ends. And for me, that became like a, a huge, uh, uh, even a depression almost when I realized that what we are doing is not always sustainable because there are no structures really to take care of this. So I was trying to think more long term and I tried to engage uh, uh, education and so on to, to have more long term structures. So I realized to create this uh, structures or infrastructures or institutions, we need to be think much more long term and not think that we can come and just solve things. It is a complex uh, situation we are dealing with. We have to work long term. Um, so these are like some of the examples from, from my practice that kind of inform my way of thinking about the frugal. And now I will show some other examples. And uh, I'm sorry for this image, it's not so, uh, it's a bit pixeled, but uh, I hope you see what it is. The first case is from India, and it's, it's called the Mythical case. Uh, the Mythical uh, is a fridge, a refrigerator that was developed by uh, an artisan in India. It, there was an earthquake and people lost access to uh, to electricity. And this is also a problem in, I would say, in many frugal uh, contexts, that lack of electricity is, uh, is something that like affects the daily life. But what the, the person did was that he invented a fridge where he made use of the local material existing, the use of knowledge from local craftsmen, he looked at the, the kind of affordances that the clay has and could see it has a kind of cooling, it, it could be, you could use it for cooling uh, goods. Um, and this was also an idea of connecting mankind with clay and soil. So, soil. so it was also a way to maybe de-industrialize uh, a product that maybe have lost its connection to the origin. origin. Um, so this kind of innovation, this frugal innovation can be seen as a pocket friendly innovation because it was developed uh, in a time where people have lost their homes and they were maybe even poor or they were probably poor before. So this was a way to also innovate for the many, for the masses and finding something that many could uh, access. And uh, the fridge is not maybe what we believe is the best kind of fridge because it, has, uh, it can't really match the standards we have, but it was good enough. In this context, it was good enough. So it didn't have certain functions, 
but it has function that was main, meant uh, meant a lot for the people who was buying it, and it was a more kind of affordable solution. And what happened after was that this man who invented it, he also started to develop other products. So now it's a company that has developed and they kind of market it as a, an Indian uh, 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 a local innovation company. And it's, it primarily focuses on household goods and the core material is clay. The other example is from our design context, if you say so. It's from UK, United Kingdom, and it's a historical case. It's called the CC41 case. During the war, World War II, there were a lot of resource scarcity because many of the materials uh, that people were using daily in clothing and uh, also with um, in furniture that it has to go to the war industry and Churchill together with the I mean the the government they decided that to start an utility program so it lasted for 10 years where they hired the best designers at that time in the UK and they got uh, the the task to design a collection of goods in furniture uh, design interior design but also in clothing that could match uh, people's ideas of fashion at that time but also made use in a very very creative way the resources you had so it was extremely important that quality consumer goods were available at reasonable prices. Uh, and they started with clothes, but it also later turned into furniture. So it had to last as long as possible. So the, the, it was like a, a long-term thinking, even if it was uh, during very specific circumstances. And the interesting part from my perspective and uh, was also this make and do and mend culture that was kind of implemented at the same time. So people were encouraged to make and do and mend. So films were developed by the government showing how you could make old items into new. So you had this inspiration for making uh, things yourself at the same time as uh, fashion were provided on a high level uh, from the government somehow. And today, this it even became uh, popular after the war because the, the quality was so good and the, the level of fashion and so on. And it has recently been published a book about this. And for me, this is a super inspiring example, historical example of maybe how we could uh, link back and look at the uh, how we could maybe work with implementing frugal thinking uh, today. So why frugal and what is the relevance today, here and now? Well, I think what you are doing right now in your many different projects ongoing uh, around CNB, but in Dalsland at large, and many of the things that are connected to uh, not quite that was talked about before, is somehow frugal. And in frugal in the way that it creatively uses resources in a good way. It makes use of local networks and it creates some kind of institution where also based on partnership. So I think even if I haven't been uh, making some kind of measurement or like uh, I cannot say that this is the way uh, you are working in a frugal way uh, more specifically, I could just see the connections that the idea of being frugal and what you are doing here is, is quite impressive. And I can see that there are many linkages. 
And two of the projects that I find is interesting in this Tillverka i Trä, where uh, many different actors go together and see what can we do with the local material uh, wood and see how we can work with it in different ways. Another interesting and very different example is Keramik Kiosken, where some local artists find out that we need a space where we can do things that is not really possible, but we use the, the resources we have and the networks we have around connected, uh, that connected uh, you, uh, when you, maybe you, some of you have studied at uh, um, Stenevi Skolan. But at this, in the, and in the same way, this is uh, uh, making uh, a good life or ma trying to find out how to do more with less of, of what you have and through some kind of cooperation. And I also think that Mötesplatz Stenerby in itself is a kind of frugal organization because you are also working somehow with the frugal innovators or designers or artists and making them, uh, supporting them how to scale up. Because I think this is where we have a huge challenge. We need to find some kind of business models where we can uh, work in a sustainable way. Uh, and so there is a lot to do, I think, about how can we work with the frugal as a kind of economic model or and how can we maybe train people to be more frugal because uh, that is good for the environment somehow. And in this case, uh, I just saw this on uh, the web uh, recently that Mötes Plastene, we have started to connect with Kivik in Skåne. Um, and the why frugal is so important, for me it's so obvious, it's about the sustainability, it's about uh, taking care of what you have and be resourceful. And when you look at the definition of sustainable development from the Brundtland the Commission report, it says development that meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So this tells about what we are doing now has to be good for the ones who also takes over after us. So it is this long term perspective. We have to do more with less for money. So this is also made clear when you look at the, the key concepts uh, in sustainable development uh, when reading this Brundtland report from 87, which was actually when sustainable development was defined for the first time. So it, it, even if uh, there exists, of course, the ideas of sustainability, sustainable development was uh, defined uh, first in 1987. And reading the report, uh, you can see that one concept is about needs and where priority should be the needs of the world's poor. And the second uh, concept is the idea of limitation concerning the environment's ability to pr meet present and future needs. And I think when we talk about sustainable development here in Sweden and Scandinavia, we of course have our idea of what it is. But I think it's, it is important that we think that what we do now, how does that affect uh, people who have less than we have, even less? Sometimes we have not so much money either. But can we do something that actually contributes to the, to the bigger picture somehow? Uh, and poverty in this case doesn't have to be only focusing on the like the money wise being poor money wise it can be that you don't have the capabilities the opportunities to do what you like or what you have a dream of and the limitation is of course something that we are very much focused on now that how do we deal with the planet limitations and the resources we have what can we do with it we are over uh, spending, we are over producing. So how can we be clever and fru fr frugal in the way that we 
work with the, the globe's resources, not only the local resources, but the ones we have uh, access to all over the globe. And I think I usually, when I, when I work for the National Handicraft Council in, we have a project called Strategisk Slade, where we try to connect crafts or handicraft practices to these sustainable development goals. I can really see that craft based and artists, many artist based uh, uh, companies and initiatives, they are sustainable and one of the sustainable goals that is very closely connected to many craft practices are sust resp sustainable, uh, responsible consumption and production. And I think maybe by studying more these goals that actually is a way to connect the global society, we could maybe learn more about what we are good at and how the frugal way of working actually is a power that we can also when we are doing applications and so on we could talk about more what we are doing that is sustainable and uh, Anneli Palmskjöld who is a researcher and, uh, at the University of Gothenburg she talks about handicrafts and people's ability to create and recreate I read this as handicraft and people's ability to create and recreate is seen as a political force to create a debate on current issues such as sustainability, ecology, consumption. Today, handmade products act as a deliberately chosen alternative to other consumer products, manufacturers on a large scale and are associated with a sustainable alternative lifestyle and environmental conscience. And again, this is where maybe there is also a very close connection between the frugal and frugality and handicraft and the people who are buying the handicraft and understanding handicraft as some kind of value for it enriched, in, enrich their life. But you also it can be also a powerful tool to create the things that you want to have without buying them. So, if we try to wrap up this now, uh, I would like to play a little bit with what we have seen on the screen. So, for example, what would happen if we, if Keramik, Josken and Mitikul met and talked about frugal design and frugal ways of working and what could maybe be an interesting uh, talk would be like, how can we work on with innovation based on craft practices what are the skills and the knowledge embedded in a craft practice or art practice that actually has a potential to do something for many like in the case with the with the fridge so we have some material uh, the, something that is captured in this material that is possible to do something with that actually could benefit many. So I think that conversation would be super interesting to see and also to see like what are the conditions for the local craftsmen, what kind of things can we learn from each other. Another thing that I think we need to look into and I'm super excited actually about this uh, art and economy uh, project where how can we frugalize society? How can we change behaviors? And maybe we have to start studying like consumer behaviors to be able to change them. And we maybe also have to talk about uh, economy in, in a different way than before, or we need to accept kind of the economic aspect of what we're doing. Because at least for me, economy, uh, it's not always what you think about when you think about uh, the way you want to practice. You, you think maybe more of the social aspect and the environmental aspects and so on, but the, to really take care of the economic aspect uh, and, and learn more. How do people uh, behave and what, what is meaningful for people? What is valuable and how can we meet that as frugal designer, artists, craftsmen. And as Lastovica et al have uh, 
realized is that there is a huge consumer group that actually wants to be frugal. So how do we find them and how do we work with them? And, and uh, uh, I mean, how do we meet these needs somehow? And what can be done uh, to make a more sustainable future somehow? Another project that I would love to see or conversation is what happens if Tilvaka uh, Tre start to uh, read and, and learn from the uh, CC41 project and see, we like talk to Svensk Form, uh, Svensk various industry design, other big organizations, and see could we do some kind of larger broad project around wood, for example, where we practiced frugal on a larger scale, like from a governmental level. What would it be if we took the best designers, artists, craftsmen, craftswomen in Scandinavia or Sweden and just made something similar to CC41? Uh, adapting it, of course, to today, but just as a conceptual thinking of how can we do things in a different way? It needs to be visible somehow. And I think we need that kind of uh, larger engagement right now. We need something where we can uh, also practice the sustainability goals. So I would love to see some larger organizations, some good projects going together, doing something. And finally, um, I think uh, the global aspect of what we're doing locally should also be stressed. So the local activity in India and in Kisumu and in Dalslonged and Shivik, what, how can we bring this together? How can we work in partnership? Because as United Nations also say in goal number 17, a sustainable development uh, agenda have to be in partnership with governments, private sector, civil society. And we have to find out the vision and goal where people and the planet are at the center on a global, regional, national and local level. So I played with this image. So instead, what would happen if Mötes uh, Plastena be next time and their friends in Kishivik went to Kisumu and see what, what do they learn from each other? What do we see as maybe potential? How can we support each other and inspire each other borrow economic models that maybe work in one context and twist it and make it possible maybe to try out somewhere else. What kind of new relationships do we need to be able to work together towards a more sustainable future? So if I would give some kind of summary or wrapping up, I would say let's use and reuse the, what, we, what already exists, the local materials, the local networks, the things that we have. Frugalize society. Let's change consumer behaviors. Let's do something on a larger scale. We can do a lot as individuals, but we need to mobilize. And I think we, it's time to talk to the larger players and get them on board. And large industries are interested. Uh, I had a lecture about frugal innovation for Ericsson uh, and they're one of the design departments in Stockholm before Christmas. They were so interested in this. So there is a huge interest. And in many books, uh, there are uh, written materials about the frugal and how to think about it. But many of these books are kind of, I would say, more short-term quick fixes and I think this is a long time journey but we need to start and I think if we do this quickly it can go quite fast. So please uh, the economists that are working in this project look help us to develop look for models and methods for upscaling in a sustainable way, tillväxt in a good way, in a frugal way and let's find out how to work together in partnerships and learn together because this is what I think is needed. So frugal economy to do more with less for many together. That is kind of what I want to 
uh, share as my way of thinking. So, thank you. Tack så jättemycket Helena.